Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our service this morning. And we'll take a moment to uh, acknowledgement of our settlers uh, as we respectfully acknowledge that Knox United Church Durham is on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabek Nation, the people of the Three Fires Confederacy, known as the Ojibwe, Adawa, and Padawani nations, we give thanks to the Chippewas of Saugeen, Chippewas of Nashua, now known as the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, as the traditional keepers of this land. Please join me for the lighting of the Christ candle. The light in all of life Shine bright light, shine upon us, filling us with your warmth and peace. Please join me for the call to worship. We gather in the presence of our God, where grieving people and children with skin knees have their tears wiped away. We gather as little children of God to worship the one who provides what we need not what we want. We gather around the table of God to taste the goodness of God, to drink deeply from God's mercy. Let's pray together. Lead us, creation's architect, into all those places where we will discover your hope waiting to nourish and restore our famished souls. Lead us, shepherd of little children, into all those places where we may have joy of filling the emptiness of others with your goodness. Lead us, spirit of goodness, into all those places where deeds of kindness and hands overflowing with mercy speak louder than platitudes. God in community, holy in one, lead us into your kingdom as we worship you now. Amen. The hymn is The King of Love.
Knowing how easy it is to wander from the paths of right living, aware of all the shadowed valleys we wander, remembering how we have failed to place our trust in God, how can we not come to God with our confessions? Please join me as we pray, saying, Comfort of your people, we confess the emptiness of our souls which sends us searching for all those things which cannot nourish us. Our restless longing for the goods of the world fill us with every lust and envy. Our belief that still waters are stagnant causes us to thirst for white water thrills and adventures. Our trust in the hollow promises of our culture turns us away from the shelter you offer to us. Forgive us, God incarnate. Call us back from our wayward lives so we may find rest in the stillness of your gentle heart. May we find healing from your scarred hands. May we find that life for which we yearn together in you and through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. This is the good news. God will walk with us in every moment. God will fill us with goodness and mercy. God will bring us home to live forever. Anointed with grace and forgiveness, our lives overflow with love for all people. Thanks be to God. Amen. You'll notice there's a hymn on the, on the screen, which we'll sing while our young people come and join us at the front. Let it shine. 
folks that are watching on the video didn't see that, but there was a whole bunch of people doing the actions to that, that old song. Boy, did you ever learn your Sunday school lessons well. <laughs> now, in all seriousness, there's a whole bunch of actions that go with that song. So, anyway, hope you enjoyed it, and hey, we hope you learn it. Um, I should show you something I've got here. Wait a minute, before I do that, i got a question. Is anyone here, or is anyone here willing to say they sleep with a night light on? You do? You do? Okay, two of you do. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. Um, I don't have a night light, but I've got a street light out front. And it's, a, no, I'd say it's bright. It's bright enough. Um, so I suppose, I guess, I've got a night light too. But what does a night light make you feel like? What does it make you feel like? Happy. Why does it make you feel happy? Because it's bright in your room, sure. What else? So you're not scared. Good point, good point. And I'm quite sure that there are those who uh, are in here, here among the adults who say, yeah, I'm, I sleep with a night light because I want to make sure I'm safe if I have to get up in the middle of the night. That's very true. But I, I discovered a long time ago that one of the things that these cell phones come with is a flashlight, which is not working. There we go. See? It's pretty bright. You don't want to look ooh, straight at it. It's bright. That's one way to keep yourself comfortable, is to use a flashlight. No, I, I don't know why. It's one of the things I've discovered is that the number of flashlights I have seem to multiply. I've got a lot of them in the house. Goodness knows why. I just have a lot of them. But they give us comfort. They give us a sense of peace. They help us feel less afraid. They help us navigate at night. But those are the, all the things that light does. But one of the other things we have to remember is that when we're afraid, when we're, we like the bright, when we want to make sure we're safe, there's one other thing that helps us. And that is God. Now, one of my favorite passages passages of scripture, which we'll talk, I'll be talking about a little later, is called the 23rd Psalm. And it begins, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But the end of it, I want to read it to you because it really helps me remember, without a nightlight, that things are okay, that I can, I can, light will be good, and it will be okay, and I don't need to be afraid. And the 23rd Psalm concludes with these words, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And what that says to me is that, hey, I don't need a nightlight to be confident. I don't need a nightlight to be afraid, to be not afraid. I don't need a nightlight to know that I'm loved. I don't need a nightlight to know that God is with me always. So whenever you're thinking, hey, things aren't all that great, I'm feeling a little uneasy, remember, God tells us time and again, I'm with you forever. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for this good news. Thank you for reminding us that you're always with us, nightlight or not. Amen. Now, if you go to Sunday school. Our scripture this morning is the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. 
You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. This is the word of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Let us keep silence for a moment. O Lord, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all our hearts, be acceptable in your sight. Amen. Well, I see that Knox Durham is like many, many, many churches that I have been in over the years. You have a picture of Christ the Good Shepherd right there as a stained glass window. And I'm sure from the... I'm looking at it from an angle, but uh, from the the style and type, I'm going to say that's of a good age. Okay, I'm not going to guess how it may even be original to the uh, before the last of the sanctuary renovation. I'm sure it was, but it is the style and the um, image is of a good age. The problem, and it's with. Something you see with all of the images of Jesus in the stained glass windows here, and it's it's one of those things that probably when they were drawn or designed, they didn't take into account. Is that Christ wasn't white? <laughs> I'll really be blunt. Jesus wasn't white. He was not Nordic. He was not European. He was Middle Eastern, and his skin would probably a more, be a more olive color than it was, or brown than it would be white. But about 150 years ago, unfortunately, I believe, these pictures started emerging of Jesus with this lily white skin. And well, we are where we are. But that image of Jesus is called Jesus the Good Shepherd. And it's a common image. You'll find it all over in many, many churches. Uh, You'll also find pictures. Although I have to say there was no such picture in the Crawford Sanctuary, no such window in the Crawford Sanctuary. I was told after church, however, there is a picture downstairs on the wall. So they're, they're like you. It's a popular picture. It's a very popular picture. The problem is that centuries of sentimentality have cloaked the strength of that image of the Good Shepherd. And we, we've kind of lost a lot of what it really means. The image actually predates Jesus. And scholars have studied this image of the Good Shepherd and found it in pottery in funeral art, in sacred texts, and in church mosaics that are 5,000, go back 5,000 years. So let's just say it's not exclusively Christian, and it is historical. The other thing about the image of the Good Shepherd is that it has been used by priests and prelates and kings to legitimize their power even when the closest thing that the king might have to a shepherd is rolling by in his, in his uh, carriage and waving at the shepherd in the pasture. In fact, this good image is almost an icon. It's, it's recognizable across human history. Because the temptation for us is to confine this good shepherd image to post-Christian or the post-Jesus era and say, well, it really didn't exist until about 5600 AD. Truth is, it's in the Old Testament too. David, the shepherd king, was lionized as the leader who was a shepherd, who refused Saul's armor and sword, and chose instead the shepherd's tools of a sling and a few stones to bring down Goliath. 
And somehow that combative nature has become an image for us. David, David's rule over a united Israel, however, was rather fraught. And if you know any of your biblical history, you'll know that he had some issues, serious issues. But indeed, you can go back earlier than that. Abraham guides his flock, both animals and human, into Canaan. And Moses abandons the sheepfolds of Sinai to liberate his people from Egyptian bondage. And I'm sure everyone here is familiar with the story of, the jo- of Joseph and the Technicolor dream coat. Hey, Joseph and his brothers were shepherds. And lest you forget your grade 9 Greek mythology, that was a staple of the Ontario curriculum, as I recall, the Greeks had shepherd images as well. Now, they had a more realistic understanding of the image of a shepherd. They were fallible leaders. The poet Homer's epics included hundreds of allusions to metaphorical shepherds, from the raging Achilles who had pastoral scenes on his sword, to the bad shepherd Paris, whose folly brings destruction on his native Troy. And this is something that the ancient Christians, the early Christian church, adopted and modified into this good shepherd image. Jesus himself uses the image of the good shepherd laying, who lays down his life for the sheep in the Gospel of John. There's also the sheep's gate. And Jesus is presented in John as the paschal lamb who gives up his own life for his people. Jesus is considered the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world but is dying very passively and emphasizes and shows us power in powerlessness. And this image of the Good Shepherd has continued to be a powerful, powerful symbol. The early Christians who were martyred were often shown as or this image was used as a hope of safe passage for those who died at the hands of the Roman Empire. There was a change about 323 AD when Constantine became the emperor who was a Christian himself. And political leaders and ecclesiastical leaders were seen as bearing that shepherd's mantle. They had, were both pastoral and regal. So they they carried both um, images in their hands. One of the early church fathers, Eusebius, lauded Constantine as a noble shepherd, whereas another, known as Ephraim the Syrian, denounced the bad shepherd, Julian the Apostate. Boy, wouldn't you like to be known as the king with that name? Julian the Apostate. Doesn't that roll off the tongue? You wonder what that was. Uh, No, not going to go there. Not going to go there. But he went on to call the emperor the duplicitous wolf in sheep's clothing. I guess that says it all, doesn't it? And then it became translated into a figure of political rulership and eventually applied only to pastors and church leaders. In fact, even today, when one is ordained, one is um, the image of the shepherd is one of those images that you are given in ministry as an ideal to follow. It's a very interesting thing as to how you see that role of the shepherd in, uh, in ministry. In about the 6th century, Gregory the Great um, identified the shepherd as a seasoned ascetic who defends truth and protects the faithful from heresy. But the good shepherd is also very full of humility and loving imitation of Christ. One of the other things that happened in this time was that there was a symbol which emerged called a bishop's crozier which acknowledged the role of the shepherd. If you've ever seen um, any Roman Catholic or Anglican liturgy, high liturgy as well, especially, 
Uh, you'll see it more commonly in Roman Catholic circles. The bishop or the cardinal, cardinal or the highest Episcopal authority always carries with them what looks like a staff with a crook over the top, kind of a loop, and inside that is off the symbol, a cross. That is called a crozier, and it comes from the original shepherd's crook, which was the device used by shepherds to uh, move, get the sheep moving and to help to rescue those who got into difficulty. Eventually, the image of the good shepherd was applied to Jesus himself and the, those who modeled his authority. And that's one of those things that we've got to kind of keep in the back of our minds as we understand the 23rd Psalm. First of all, we have no idea who wrote the 23rd Psalm. It's attributed to David, but that's questionable. And it really doesn't matter. Because to be honest with you, the text's power does not reside in the, the shepherd but in its resilience across the centuries in both Jewish and Christian interpretation to bring confidence and trust. Even though things may be difficult, even though you may be facing your literal enemies, the Lord is still concerned with you and me personally, and the Lord is our shepherd. And that means that God is with us and God will meet our needs. One of the things that you can get into, and I think it's important to get into in the 23rd Psalm, is language. The, he restores my soul is kind of a, a difficult phrase for us to understand in this day and age. But I'd like to suggest to you, if you replace the word life, soul, with life, I think it becomes more clear. He restores my life. God gives us life. That's the role of God, to give us life, to show us the way, to show us how we can live our lives faithfully, openly, clearly, and in a committed way. But it's more than that. When we restore life, we emphasize God's care for us no matter what happens. When we hear the words, valley of the shadow of death, all of a sudden we are reminded that we are mortal creatures. That at some point we will die. And there will be times in our lives when we enter that valley of the shadow of death and let your imagination run wild with that one. Or you can simply refer to the dark days of life itself or suffering. That in times of all of these, these valleys of the shadow of death, they may be physical, they may be actual, they may be, they may be emotional, they may be spiritual, they may be something in your life which involves suffering, but God is with you. But if there's anything that the 23rd Psalm reminds us of is that there is more. The last verse of the 23rd Psalm goes like this. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And there's a word I want to, to talk about for a moment. I deliberately went back to an earlier translation of the 23rd Psalm because contemporary translations use the, word, use the phrase at the very end, for I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. And that's what we read this morning. But I'll be honest with you, that does not satisfy me because the word forever, which was in the Revised Standard Version, and what I'm sharing with you now, has a deeper, deeper implication. It has not just an implication for the past or the present that I am living. It has an implication for the future. And that 
in this Easter season, this time of resurrection is the, is the hook we need to hang things on. Our life, our faith, our hope. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It means the past and the present and the future. And that is something for us that we can be mindful of, but most importantly, take confidence in forever. Ponder that. Think about that. Remember that. Take comfort in that word. Because we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let us pray. Loving God, we give thanks that you not only give us encouragement, you give us hope. Hope that will never die. For you will be with us and we will be with you forever. Thank you, God. Amen. The hymn is The Lord's My Shepherd. And now let us present our tithes and our offerings for the work of the Lord. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. 
give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his son and now let the weak say I am strong let the poor say I am rich because of what the Lord has done for us give thanks give thanks as we offer our gifts to you gentle shepherd may we lay down our prejudices towards others so they might find a welcome in our hearts May we set aside our fears of the future so you might lead us into your future. May we become the goodness and mercy for which others have been looking for all their lives. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As God's people, let us pray. Eternal God, as Jesus and the early church cared for those in need, we pray for all who suffer and are not cared for or whom care cannot reach. We pray for the elderly who die alone, the young who are neglected or cruelly treated, young and old whose weaknesses are exploited, and sensitivities abused. We pray for all who have grown hopeless and weary as each day is like the last, for those who face hunger and homelessness with no way out, refugees from war and violence to whom no one wants to give a home, those whose lives have been wrecked by conflicts they do not understand and cannot affect or change hounded by economic and political forces or by the impact of climate change which take no account of their need. In this world of so much suffering, we pray too for all who are affluent, comfortable, warm and cared for who do not care. For those who know what they should do but do not bother. For those who close their eyes and minds and those who simply find other people's troubles and needs across they do not wish to bear. We pray for those who do care. Those who accept the pain and disturbance that knowledge brings but do not see what they can do. Those whose consciences are hurt and who want to help but cannot see how. We pray for all who do care who are willing to go the extra mile time and again, often in a co- at a cost in so many ways. For those who go where trouble, pain, and poverty are, risking life and limb, facing danger and fear. Loving God, as we pray, increase the depth of love in us and in others who have something to give to the ill, the troubled, and dying. Give us such love that your sheep, both inside and outside the fold, may be found, given health, strength, food, and the ability to enjoy life to the full and the joy to praise you. We thank you that Jesus is the Good Shepherd and for your grace and mercy that has made us part of his flock. Thank you that you watch over your flock. You know us by name. You understand what we are like. You call us to follow and you accompany us along the path, seeking us out when we stray, keeping a loving eye on what we do. Lead us into your future on the adventure of faith for Jesus' sake. This we pray in the name of Jesus who showed us his way in these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. 
And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The hymn is How Sweet the Name of Jesus Sounds. Let us go to be bold before God. We will speak up for all people who long for healing and hope. Let us go to shepherd Jesus' sisters and brothers. We will risk our lives for justice. We will serve the outcast. Let us go to anoint others with the Holy Spirit. We will bring goodness and mercy to all those lives need restoring. So go. Go into the world, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. from above.